So, um, I'm going to start off by saying I was not an outdoor kid. I hated the outdoors. Uh, there's too many mosquitoes, there's too many ticks and everything. I, I grew up in Philadelphia where there's snow, and I hate snow. So, uh, I was not an outdoor kid at all. Um, in fact, I don't get inspiration from nature. I'm fascinated by students who always go, oh, I was walking in the park and it was all pretty. And I'm like, no. For me, I get my inspiration from cities. I get my, information, my inspiration from man-made, built environments. Um, although I do like uh, interior, I do like spaces that are designed, that are unnatural, that are inspired by nature, like Sagrada Familia uh, in Barcelona. But I really uh, gravitate more towards the unnatural, the man-made, the designed environments, uh, like Wanamaker's Department Store in Philadelphia. Uh, I, I love miniature golf courses. I love theaters. I love themed restaurants. Um, so uh, I like museums a lot, but I like museums that have dioramas of the outdoors. Um, I like uh, ones that have interactive or immersive uh, uh, displays or are places where you can learn about science by being immersed or uh, walking through them or interacting with them. Um, I like weird sort of historical recreated villages like historical colonial Williamsburg or the Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts. Um, and I like malls. I love shopping malls. Not because I like to shop, because I really don't, but unlike a forest where the trees aren't labeled and you don't know what kind they are, Stores have beautiful, colorful, bright typography, and everything is labeled, you know what everything is. So I tend to like environments like this. And if you like stores, I also like store display windows, because they're these wonderful set pieces. Um, so of course, I like theme parks. Uh, I grew up in the Northeast. I did uh, most of the East Coast parks, like Disney World, Hershey Park, Great Adventure, Bush Gardens. Um, Wait a minute, I gotta put my glasses on because I have notes here for this one. Um, oh, but when I went to college, I wanted to study being a theme park maker. But in 1982, there were no programs about how to become a theme park maker because that just wasn't a thing. Um, so I had to do a lot of research on my own. And at that point, there were no, there was no internet, there were no, there was no Google, there was no YouTube. So I had to do a lot of research in libraries and books and periodicals. And I found some very weird little parks, unknown ones. Um, this one is a Bible Storyland, uh, which was supposed to be built here in Rancho Cucamonga, um, oddly enough. And I know you're looking at it going, it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's actually designed by a lot of the old Disney people. Um, there is also one called Freedom Land USA, which I love that it was the shape of the United States. Uh, <laughs> And when I, was in when I was in grad school, that's when I discovered Photopia. And I kind of fell in love with Photopia because I thought it was this really great place because it was more than just a theme park. It really had more to it. Um, but the other thing was that I have always looked at theme parks as art, as a form of art, and especially an American art form. Uh, this is a Thomas Kincaid because, you know, art. Um, <laughs> I say it's an American art form, but it didn't have been invented here. Actually, theme parks started uh, with the Pleasure Gardens of 17, 1700, 1800 Europe. Um, but only in America are we going to build uh, Venice in the Nevada desert, or Bavarian villages in uh, Georgia, or a Chinatown in every city that there is. And, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, Shanghai Disneyland opened in 2016, and the final cost for it was 3.7 billion, with a B, dollars, and then an additional 700 million dollars for some of the outside of the park theme, uh, theme park stuff. Um, but the question came about is, is a theme park art? And if we use the definition of art is something that is, uh, comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable, well, then yeah. Theme parks comfort the disturbed. And theme parks <laughs> disturb the comfort. And if you've been following what's been going on in Florida, yeah. uh, there's a lot of problems going on with Disney and DeSantos. And, and last year, when COVID took over Disney, I, never, I couldn't believe how many Orange County residents were out there pissed that the theme park wasn't open. 
<laughs> what, what we found out was that theme parks really hit an emotional uh, level for us. And we tend to respond more to it than real life. So in my research, I came upon these, seven, or these six books, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these books and what I gleaned from them, and how they really kind of will help you look at this exhibit a little bit better. Uh, the first book is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. And this is a book, who, has anybody ever had me for visual thinking? This is a book that I make everybody read, and the reason I do is because it focuses, one part, on this painting by Rene Magritte uh, called The Treachery of Images. And of course, what does this say? This is, not a pipe. this is not a pipe, and that's correct. This is not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe. What Scott McCloud, though, does in his book is that he goes in to explain this, and then he goes on to say, but what you're really looking at here is a drawing of a painting of a pipe. Yeah. And right now, you guys are looking at a projection of a picture of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. So we are now multiple steps away from what a real pipe is. And that's kind of what the treachery of an image is. Um, Another book was written by Dr. Stephen Fjellman of Miami International University called Vinyl Leaves. And it's a so, he's a sociologist, and he looked very closely at the sociological impact of what Disney is all about. And this is the one that really taught me about how theme parks really play on your sense of a nostalgia, or your emotions uh, are tied to this sort of inauthentic realism. Um, because we all know Main Street didn't really exist. And, the Dapper Dans are just four guys who go around singing, and, and there no roller or no train in the West looked like this either. But we have this emotional response to this inauthentic land. And what's interesting is that this book was written in '97, but we still are right now experiencing emotional response to things that are inauthentic, like reality television or a simulated digital reality. People are just hooked on their phones for this fake environment that's right here. Um, the name of the book comes from uh, the fake leaves that were made for the then Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse. Now it's Tarzan's Treehouse. So it's these fake leaves that are actually really supposed to be natural. Yeah, it's, it used to be so much fun. And the organ playing is way better. Much better. Still, too many steps. I don't do it anymore. It's too, it's too naturalistic for you. Right, it's too natural for me. It's like, Ew. Um, the next book was Learning from Las Vegas. And this is a very important book for anybody who's in architecture. Uh, it's written by um, uh, Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and uh, Stephen Eisenhower. And they explore this idea of buildings being two different types of buildings. Either there's the decorated shed which is just a box that's festooned with graphics and logos and labels to tell you what's going on inside, or a duck building, which is named after this building, which is in Long Island, and the building itself works as a sign to tell you what's going on inside. In this case, it happens to be a place that sells duck eggs. Um, so he explains this, and he talks about how actually Las Vegas is really nothing more than these decorated sheds. If you look at them, they're just boxes, but they have lots of glitter and type on them and lights. But in LA, we actually had the duck buildings. We had a whole form of California crazy architecture, which is really called programmatic, uh, programmatic architecture, where the building is a billboard. It's a sign for the automobile age. So as you're driving down the road, you know what these things are. Um, and its cousin, to California Crazy is Googie style architecture, which I absolutely, I'm a big fan of. Um, because the building becomes a billboard. Um, while we're traveling, we might as well look at Umberto Eco's Travel and Hyperreality. And this is the book that introduced me to the term hyperreality. Um, hyperreality is defined as a copy without an original. It's kind of an esoteric idea. Where he defines it th is this way. Um, in his travels, he would go to all these places throughout the United States, going to tourist attractions or uh, museums, and he would go to wax museums. And wax museums aren't, a, aren't as big anymore, but they used to be in every city. And the final tableau in a lot of, art, in a lot of wax museums is The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. So here's this 3D replica of 
a 2D painting that was done by a guy who must have imagined it because he was never there in the first place, right? But what Umberto Eco tells us about is that when you're leaving the wax museum and you go through the gift shop, you can buy a chocolate bar that is in the shape of the 3D replica of the 2D painting. So it's kind of looking like Rene Magritte's pipe again, right? So this is this idea of hyperreality. And John Baudrillard said it again in his book, uh, Simulacra and Simulation. Um, and it's the idea that it's something that should represent something else, but in fact, it represents itself. For example, this is Mexican food, correct? Right? This is not Mexican food. <laughs> this is Taco Bell. Although it's supposed to be reminiscent of Mexican food, it's the idea that it's its, its own thing. And as my husband will attest, sometimes you want Mexican food and sometimes you want Taco Bell, which is not Mexican food. <laughs> but John uh, Baudrillard takes it one step further, and I just discovered these, and now I want to find them. Taco truck jelly beans yes, oh my God. that come in uh, margarita and churro and salsa flavor. So again, it's this idea that it is a thing unto itself. This is hyper reality at its best, right? Just CVS. CVS has them. CVS yesterday, I saw them over there. Okay, we're stopping at CVS on my home. <laughs> um, the final book is a uh, playground, uh, a propaganda playground. Um, by Dr. Uh, Wilma Dean of Orwellian University. Um, and it's a history of American theme parks. And she was one of the people who actually put Photopia into my mind because she was telling me this idea of, she took all the information from the other books and kind of quelled it into this one uh, book. And this is the quote that actually is, starts the show here for you. And it's that only in the 20th century America, and now the 21st century, could a multi-billion dollar industry be based on storytelling and deception, flourish, prosper, and develop an almost cult-like fan base? And everyone seems to be happy about it. So with that, I welcome you to the treasures of Photopia, artifacts, memorabilia, and souvenirs from the most believable place on Earth. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. I have seen Dismal Land. Do you um, have any thought on that? And Dismal Land, I think, is a really great answer to what Photopia is. Okay. Um, more of an art form. This was more a part of an industry, I think. Uh, I think this is bigger. I think he is. I think Photopia is bigger than Dismal Land. I was. I really wanted to go, but I understand why it closed down because that's when they were bringing in the refugees oh. and. They closed down Dismal Land and gave the land over to refugees that were escaping from, I can't remember which war it was, I think it was from, uh, um, uh, no, 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 the, um, Sarajevo, Sarajevo, right? Yeah, and so they were given an encampment there, which I was like, yeah, that's great. Oh, I thought it was just like a temporary, I didn't realize it was. It was, it was, all, it was supposed to be up for like something like nine months, and it closed down in three because of that. Okay. Yeah. I but just, I just like how it just kind of, you know, brings that into your mind. Parts and mm -hmm. questioning reality and, and everything just kind of like how Photopia is. Good. Well, being compared to Banksy, I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> Allison? I know that this this has been a, pro, a culmination. This is a culmination of, of years of work. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just so curious to, to know if, that we're seeing this all at once. Is there is there something in the show that was kind of the beginning and then and then something that maybe was like the last piece. <laughs> and is there is there a, like is there a, is there a do recent, you see a kind recent. of yeah? Do you see any kind of you know even an evolution from the first to the last, or did you go back and change everything? No, I do. I see the evolution of it. Um, and I don't know if anybody would, other than if you weren't there for the whole thing. Yeah. But um, I can tell you the very last piece that went into the show. 
which was a piece that I actually designed early, 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 early on and totally forgot about it. And that's the t-shirt, the, the blank, official blank t-shirt. Because it was one of those things that I put it in my, I, I put it in there years ago and forgot about it. And right before the show opened, I literally said to Michelle, I totally forgot something, can we add it? And she was like, yes, we can. So it was like, I quick got it out of storage and we put it up. Um, but, the, but the idea, um, the big change I think came in 2016, uh, especially when all of a sudden fake news became a common term. Mm -hmm. And people started recognizing that there was a new reality that we were not getting the whole, info we weren't getting all the story all the time. Um, the piece that actually became very pivotal for me was the, um, the red herring piece in the middle of the street sign of the corner of here and now. Because that was a piece that I had talked about early, early on and forgot about it. And then I came back to it and I went, no, 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 this needs to be here because this is actually the thesis of the piece. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What does the name Photopia mean to you? Hmm. Living in a wonderful fakeness. <laughs> And then when we build it in the city, it'll be Photropolis. <laughs> Don't worry, I've thought about that already. <laughs> I've already got that under control. Next step. Next step, yeah. Will you ever actually write the book? <laughs> the book? <laughs> um, well, I want to write a guidebook for this. That would be great. And it'll pull in all this stuff. Mm. Um, so yes, there will be something. It's stay telling tuned. us, it'll be, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> um, and it depends, I mean, other people are more than welcome to like partake in it. In fact, I actually gave this to students one time to see what they could do with it, and they did brochures for each one of the attractions. Mm. So yeah, there's been some fun things that have been happening with it. Very cool. Um, one thing that I did do with this was, um, I wanted to see if I could tackle all of our disciplines in our department. So you know how we have illustration or drawing, and, 2D, 3D, 4D, and 5D, and I'm not a 4D or 5D guy at all. So I taught, I forced myself. So the game that's in there, I actually worked with a, a student who's from the computer club who helped me program it, and he put it together. The videos were something that was what I proposed as my start, and once I started, I was realizing, oh, I've got all these props and things, now I gotta put it, why not have a show? So it became this, like, I've learned now all the different aspects of what our students are going through with every one of these projects. Um, the book is the last part. <laughs> Ralph? Um, this style of typography and illustration, did, was this something you were already doing in undergrad work, or where did you learn all this? Was it on your own? Did they actually teach you this? Or sort of entertainment typography, which is really great. Uh, I, I've always had a love for um, mid-century type. Okay, put it this way, I, I was never a modernist. I was never a grid person, forgive me, Sarah. I hate, <laughs> I hate, I hate grids, I hate layout grids. Um, because I like, things that pop, I like things that go all over the place. Mm -hmm. And when I was in grad school, I had a professor, uh, Rob Carter, who was a true modernist, and he was doing, telling me I wasn't, I wasn't lining things up properly. <laughs> And I called him a modernist zombie. And he was like, what? And I was like, Jews, I must follow grid. <laughs> and, I, and he just looked at me and goes, ah, postmodern kid. <laughs> and so it was one of these things where I was just like, yeah, I am. I like, I like goofy. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we had an assignment where we had to pick our favorite type, our favorite type and do a poster piece for it. And um, the professor said, I want you to pick the type that you're having, the type you love, the type you have an affair with. <laughs> so everybody came in the next day and we had Helvetica and Garamond and Baskerville and Futura. I think that it, like Futura, like really classic faces. And I came in with one called Moon Pie Cadet. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, looked at me and I just said, you said affair, not relationship. <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? And I just said, if I'm, I'm a fun. Yeah. And he got it. And so, yeah, dec yeah, I'm all about decorative type and, and headline type. It's, it's just a lot of fun. But it, I, didn't, I don't know how I learned it. I just learned it. So. Uh, yeah, that gives me food for thought in my classes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry.
Sorry, kids. <laughs> there is, right. you know, it's funny though, because it's not as, it, it, I used to think it was just simple, and my type teacher that I had as an undergrad, I remember I bounced letters. Now, it was the 80s, so we were allowed to do things like that. But I remember bouncing letters, and he told me that if I was going to bounce it, I got to bounce it. Like, you can't do it halfway. You really got to make the extreme. And I went, got it, okay, and I did it, and it worked. Now, I was traumatized by um, the Yale people. In the which one? The Yale people in uh, undergrad. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, they would have hated me. scarred from that, and I'm trying to move away from that. Well, <laughs> mixed things. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you have a favorite attraction that you've made? Ephotopia? Yeah. Um, the one that I'm really drawn to currently is uh, the Cultivate House, the House of Cultivate, uh, because it's the one that I'm actually going to be probably exploring a little bit more and bringing it into my visual thinking class. Um, those of you who have me for visual thinking, you know I personify everything. <laughs> the Cultivate's going to be in there. Because I think it is a way to look at your imagination and figure out how you can mine your head to come up with new ideas. Mm. If you had your pick of animation houses, would you go with Disney or no. DreamWorks or? Uh, no, I would probably go with a. I would probably go with like uh, Cuspy Suko, the people yeah. either like I would like yeah. like Rugrats or the guys who did like Ren and Stimpy. Mm -hmm. uh, I the irony of making Disney do this would be. I don't think Disney would buy it. Think, as a matter of fact, we have uh, a, we College of Unity has a relationship with Disney, and I reached out to the vice president uh, Bob Weiss, and he was like, "I'll be there," and I'm like, "Yeah, sure you will." Um, <laughs> but we did have some of our alumni who are Imagineers that were here the other day, and they're walking around going, "Oh, jeez!" Like all of a sudden they're realizing what they're part of, and that was kind of fun to like. It'd <laughs> <laughs> so. be fun to like lead a team of all of them. Like, you have to work on this now. You're gonna do Hitler's rise above the masses with Walt Disney. I, I don't see that. Would I don't think that would be a problem. I think they would probably go. Are we gonna make money out of it? And then they would go. Okay, let's do it. They could make money out of it. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the show. I'm around if you have any other questions. Thank you very much for coming.